Hello everyone, good morning, welcome aboard Sea Urchin. My name's Andy and today we're just coming through first light and I'm going to make a, a short video today covering up tiding. The first video that I did at the beginning of last year was based on up tiding but I didn't have any microphones or any sort of sound equipment and to be honest the you know the sound and the noise was absolutely horrific so I thought I'd try and revisit it and do another one so I'll cover some of the same topics but hopefully it'll be easier to understand I've been trying to do this video for ages it's difficult running a charter boat and then trying to find days where I've got windows to go out and film right so I've got the anchor down we're uh, I've just picked a spot on the way down to Robin Hood's Bay there the ground is really really rough and there is a million and one places to fish there really are so what I thought I would do is to just try and demonstrate how rough the ground is at Whitby so the whole purpose of doing this video is to talk about up tiding down tiding on a charter boat fishing out of Whitby I'm not trying to advocate and tell you this is how to do it in other parts of the country it's just based on my experience at Whitby and seeing the people that I give my higher tackle to on the boat I can get them going I can get them catching fish and so that that's what I'm going to talk about today on the left screen you can see I've got um, Navionics relief shading on and just looking at you can see that the, the, the blue, the right hand side of the screen that's got the, the blue ground on, that's the deeper water and then as you come in it, it turns sort of yellow and then red. So we're fishing in like the yellow band. So if I zoom in a bit, you can start to see how rough this place is. It's really rough. So there we are. I don't know whether they'll be able to make out the little yellow boat on the screen. That's where we're sitting. So very quickly, we did this on the, the first video, but as you can see, nothing's changed. Terminal tackle wise, I'm going to have a go fishing with two rods today. Ordinarily I only use one, but I've got two, so I'm going to use them. The rod is a Daiwa Tournament QDA. Not really too much of note, apart from the fact that it's the casting weight that you're interested in. So we use a 5 to 10 ounce up tiding rod because we're using six ounce breakaway leads you're not casting a million miles you don't need to cast far at all really uh, but that's a, like a five to ten ounce rated rod is ideal something that's got a soft tip my higher rods i use the 20 30 ugly sticks they have a glass tip they're perfect for it with this rod i've also got a daiwa tournament qda reel the the reel I, I like it because it has a really quick drag it's instant literally i do half a turn and it'll go into free spool so when the boat starts swinging around, it's really good for me to, I can let line off in an instant. Uh, the reel's loaded up with 60 pound braid, same as I use on the wrecking, exactly the same braid. I don't see any reason to change it. We're fishing in really snarly rough areas. I don't put a shock leader on, but I fish um, tapered. So my braid's 60, my lead slides on a 50 pound boom, and my hook trace is a 40 pound boom, but we'll cover them more as we go through. So that's the gear. If it sounds like I'm rushing, I am, because I am itching to get the rods in. So that's the gear. Bait front. On the bait front today, as if, for anybody who's seen my catch reports, and all the other skippers for that matter, the majority of the things that get used at Whitby for up tiding are black lugworm and squid. So that's all I've brought today. Black lug and squid. Um, the way to fish is being organised. Just everything about fishing is be organised. So when I fish, I'm going to fish two rods. But in order for me to fish two rods effectively, I need to have four bait traces on the go. I'll have two in the water and then I'll have two tied up ready. When you're up tiding, the fish often move through in packs. So what you want to be is organised enough to get, to get a bite, get a fish up and then just unhook it put your next baited trace on and get back in. So then potentially that every group of fish that move through, instead of you just taking a fish, you might take two or sometimes even three before they drift through. So in order to bait up, bait elastic, 
bait elastic comes in three different types. I'm going to have to try and squat down here so you can see my face. Um, yeah, bait elastic comes in three different types. Extra fine, fine and a thicker version. I use the middle of the road, I just use fine bait elastic. The real thick stuff's a bit of a nightmare to cut off the hooks. Talking of hooks, I'll come closer now. Talking of hooks, that's the hook arrangement. You can see on the top there, it's a panel arrangement. We've got a 5-0 circle hook and then underneath it we have a 6-0 wide mouth hook. Strong hooks, decent size hooks. We're fishing for hopefully some nice size codling. And then on these we're just going to mount a whole squid. Now there's lots of there's various types of squid. Personally, my own personal preference for uptiding is for the dirty unwashed squid, which is slightly smaller. So that's what we use. And then all we do is we take the bottom big hook and we hook it into the squid, leave it in, and then just push it out of the bottom. So the hook comes out of the bottom of the squid, hook it through the eyes and the head of the squid, which is the juicy bit. And then we slide down the panel hook. We measure him to the top of the we measure the panel hook to the top of the squid there and then we go around twice and then hook it in the top of the squid. So what you end up then is your hooks your squid's already mounted all looking nice already. Excuse me, I'm not properly organized. I haven't got my black lug worm opened up. So These were frozen, I've taken them out, they're now defrosted. And then all we do is we just hang the worm over the hook and then drop on some bait elastic. The reason that we use bait elastic is because there's lots of nuisance fish, like pouting, whiting, um, and they will, and doggies, we get an odd dogfish as well. So we put plenty of elastic on to stop them stripping the hooks off in no time at all. As you can see, I am putting plenty on. Don't worry, it doesn't deter the fish from biting or anything like that. Okay. So, that's one trace done. That's a hook bait. Looks nice. What I'm going to do, I'll do another one up quickly and then like I said, I want to get these rods in and make the most of this tide. What happens on the smaller tides, as soon as it starts to run towards slack water, slack water is the bit that's in between the flood and the ebb. On the smaller tides, the boat will start to swing much quicker. Big tides, the tide turns a lot faster. So what I'm trying to do is make the most of this flood tide this morning. So, drop the second worm on, elastic, and away we go. You'll find that you do this a heck of a lot during the course of a day. So even if you've never done it before, when you come on board, I'll show you how to do it again anyway, that's no problem. And yeah, you'll find that once you've done 10 baits or so, it's easy. The main thing to take and to be conscious of as you can see it on mine, is that your hooks are standing proud so that they can get in the fish. Okay, that's two tied up. Another thing that's always critical is a cloth, otherwise you end up covered in squid and lug juice. Right, I'm going to get these rods out. So, first things first. So I'll bring my rod over. And, yeah, so this is the the setup. So we have a th uh, sort of a two and a half, two foot, two and a half foot sliding boom. There's a pulley bead that just runs in between the knots. I don't have beads or anything. There's just a pulley bead on there with my 170 gram, six ounce breakaway lead. That runs down to this snap swivel, crane swivel. And the crane swivel, then I just put in the hook trace. So you can change everything over really quickly, which is exactly what you want to be doing. 
speed is of the essence, as I'm hoping that you can hear in my voice. Once, once we've not had any bites for half an hour, it'll be different, but... So, in order to cast on a charter boat, you can have up to eight other, sorry, seven other people. I take eight people out up tiding. So you've got to be very careful when you're casting a pronged lead and we don't want baits flying around. So what we do is the bottom hook that's got the squid's head is we just hang it on the arms of the lead. Don't worry about it tangling, that will come off when you cast. But it's important, otherwise you'll, you'll end up either catching somebody's line, catching somebody's head, it's, you know, that's how you eliminate it. And then we just simply, I'm not, I'm not fishing far from the boat, really not. Nice and close. So, and then we, I'm slowing the descent of the lead just a touch, it helps reduce tangles, I've found. So I'm effectively doing what is called down tiding. I'm fishing off the back of the boat, I'm not casting up into the tide, I'm casting down the tide. And then once the lead's down, we pay off, and this is absolutely critical, we pay off a good arc of line. The reason that we pay off an arc of line is so that it gives the lead, the, the, the arms of the lead, it gives them the chance to bite into the bottom and grip the bottom. If you don't pay any line out, all that will happen is your lead will break out of the bottom and then it will trundle and move around until it finds itself a nice rock or crevice or basically somewhere to get stuck. So it is really important. And depending how fast the tide's running, through experience, I've found it, dip that's, it dictates how much line you need to pay off. You can get away with paying less off. It really doesn't matter because the braid really does transmit the bites. I'm fishing in, the boat, the boat was anchored in 17 metres, but I'm actually fishing in 19. There's a drop off. Right, so we get the rods in. That's that, that's the that's the main bit done. I'm fishing. It's a bit fresh this morning. I was hoping we might get some a little bit of sun, but no, it's quite grotty. Before I start tying my next baits on, what I'm doing is I've got my hands in my pocket because top tip for winter. You can get all sorts of different ones. These are USB hand warmers. They actually double up as phone chargers as well if you choose to. And they're absolutely ideal. I just put one in each pocket and then when your hands get, start to get cold while you're fastening the squid off and all that kind of business, you can just stick your hands in your pockets and it literally does keep them nice and warm. When we're up tidy, what's, what's the pattern? More often than not, when you put the anchor down, there will be fish within the vicinity of the boat. they would be quite close. There could be some just sat literally at the back underneath it or, you know, in the areas around the boat. So sometimes the first people in, you'll get a series of bites within two or three minutes of being at a new spot. And then quite often you get two or three fish and then it'll go quiet. And I think that's because the fish in that in the area have then either moved through or spooked away a bit. Then a lull in proceedings, sometimes 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then you'll get the next flush of fish move through, because the fish are always moving up and down the tide. You'll get the next flush come through, and you'll get a series of bites. If we've got eight people fishing, you might get three or four rods will go, literally within the minute. And that's the way it is. Some days you get a lot more You'll just steady away, just keep picking away without having quiet spells. But most days, you get flushes of fish running through. Oh, there we go. We've got a bit of an inquiry on this right hand rod. So what I'm not doing, as you can see, is panicking and whipping the rod up and striking and whining like a maniac. What we need to do is, so now it's, it's showing a bit of interest 
when I get something a little bit more positive, I'm just going to pick the rod up and then I will, I won't wind straight down unless it's really thumping away. I will wait until I feel the fish has got hold of the bait properly and it's, when it's continually banging, then I will wind down and lift into the fish. What you don't do is just strike straight away. And the reason that you don't do that is because as your lead got to the bottom, you just paid off a big arc in your line. And if you strike, nothing will happen because you've got that arc of, so you need to take the slack out of the line. Hence, when you can feel it tapping away is wind down and then lift and that will set the hooks. Sometimes the fish hook themselves. Sometimes the fish actually hook themselves without you even seeing a bite. You know, you might have had your back turned just for a minute while you were putting on a fresh bait or something. And yeah, they've jumped on. And then they'll just go sit and sulk, hiding in a little gully or behind a rock or something like that until you wind them in. Right, we'll have a look at this one now, because something's definitely playing around with it. Yeah. So I just check my clutch. Okay, wind down and lift. Yeah, we've got him. First fish. Right, I think. Yeah, my lead. That's it, my lead's out now. It's only a small fish. Well, at least we've had a bite first cast at something. Oh no! <laughs> the one thing that I'm not right keen on catching. The pretty fish, but yeah. He's a wolf. A little dogfish. Okay, top tip with dogfish. They've got very, very rough skin. So when you get hold of them, if you can, get hold of the tail and the head at the same time. This one's only lip hooked. Yeah. Yeah, they're really, really rough skinned. And if, if in the summer you catch them and they wrap themselves around your arm, they give you, it's like somebody's just rubbing sandpaper on your arms. The bonny fish, I don't know if he's going to look at the camera for us or not, they've got beautiful eyes, they've got a beautiful green eye. Right, hopefully there's not going to be millions, oh I've got another bike, look. Let's have a look at this one, see what this is. See I didn't, even though it was tapping away behind me, I didn't automatically just strike, I want to wait until I can feel that there's something occurring on the hook. He's on. This one's nodding a bit. I think this will be a codling. When you when you when you play the fish, I, I'm trying to keep the rod in shot so you can see the, that there is a fish on. But the the key to getting them up is just like we've been through on the wrecking ones and the rough is slow and steady wins the race. Yeah, slow and steady wins the race. You've got to remember that the, they're, you, you're dragging them up against the tide. And when you drag them against the tide, the cod have got huge mouths. So when they open the mouth, I don't think this is a tiny fish if I'm honest. But the tide really does exaggerate. I might need my landing net first cast. It'll be getting somewhere close now. Sometimes these better fish 
come up quite a long way from the back of the boat. He's all right, he's a nice one. Not a monster of the deep. But I'll put the net under him. So we're happy enough with that for a first one. Right. So with the fish, first thing I've done, I've detached it. And now we lift this big this fish up. It's not a bad one. It'll be four pound, I think. Right. Always have your forceps to hand. Right, that's got the hook out. So. Yeah, bonny fish. I'm not taking anything, so I'm going to throw this one back. But obviously he's a comfortable eating size. That's a great start. Right, I'm going to get him back, get some more baits tied up. And away. Well, even though the conditions aren't fantastic, my hands are reaching the point where I can't really feel a great deal. But, don't care because I'm catching. So after that nice little start, I need to get the get the rods rebaited, get them back in the water. This time I'm going to get try and, and get ahead of the game and instead of talking and blathering on so much, see if I can get four baits tied up so we can put a, a string of fish together and get these back out. Paying off that line, slowing down the descent. Only a fraction. It doesn't. You don't need to. But I literally want to feel the moment the lead touches down, because then, there it's down. Then I know exactly how much line I've got paid out. I think that's probably the biggest error that I see people make who've not done much up tiding is getting their heads around how much line to let out. And more often than not, they don't let enough. You'll know whether you've let enough line out when your lead first settles, if your rod tip starts nodding and bouncing, that's not a fish, that's your lead rolling, which means that you haven't paid off enough line. That tends to happen more in the bigger tides. Yeah, so talking of tides, um, we've done we've done tidal range before at Whitby, but tidal range for up tiding. Really, what you want is a bigger tide. You want a bit of tide running through. Um, that really helps, I think. So by a bigger tide, I'm talking really five meter plus. I don't like the absolutely monstrous ones. That they're like the five sevens, eights, and nines. I really don't, well I don't normally go out in them full stop, um, I just think they become very hard to fish, they become very hard to get the anchor right and so I'm, I'm a like five meter to five six five seven anywhere in amongst there that's a, a, a really good tide for up tiding I find. One of the things that I personally do, some people don't but I do, oh there we go a bit of an inquiry, um, is I'll never leave a bait in the water for more than sort of 10, 15 minutes. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that when you're up tiding, it's all about scent. Oh, we've got another bite as well. 
Well, he's going to have to wait. I'll get this one up as fast as I can. But that's, that's the classic um, pack of fish, isn't it, that I was talking about before. Being organised enough. I mean, sometimes if it gets too frantic, you reach the point where you can't fish two rods. Which is a, a, really, a really nice situation to be in. I'm going to have to just dump this fish on the deck. Little codling. I'll just leave him down there and then have a look and see if this is still on. Because you'd be surprised sometimes that even with bites like that, the fish hasn't hooked itself. I think this one might have. Oh, it's just come off. That's fine. I've got two baits ready to go. Right. Let's get this other little chap. This other little chap up. Disconnect. I always find it's much easier if you just disconnect the bait trace. <clears throat> so not enormous but equally not tiny got the hook out there that's not not, a, not an enormous fish but uh, that would would be a takeable size codling uh, I'm not taking them but right we'll pop him back time is of the essence there's a noticeable difference some days between how the bites materialise. Sometimes you get these, uh, they just, every now and again, well, like's happening at the moment actually, you just get a little peck and then it's stopping and then it comes back and another little peck. Whether that's because it's some of the smaller mouth fish like the doggies or, I'm, I'm not too sure. But the cod in particular, when the codling come in, some days the bites are really finicky, even, even for the better sized fish. Yet then you get days where they're dialed in and they're literally ravenous and they just absolutely smash the rod top straight away. Right, while well, I've got a chance, I'm going to have a pour a cup of tea. Most needed. could do with a hood up really well that's not very filming friendly is it having a hoodie oh. the world's a better place with Yorkshire tea yeah so I don't know whether you can see the sea state behind me there's uh, little bits of white water there's definitely flecks of white now um, the thing that's causing that is the wind against the tide. When the wind meets the tide, it pushes the waves up, and that's what's happening here. There's a bit of swell come through there. But for uptiding, you can see there that that rod is, this right hand rod there has just moved. That's because of the height of the wave that's come through. So I'm just going to pay off a touch more line. I'm only going to give these a couple more minutes and then I'm going to bring them in and recast. What we tend to find, or what I tend to find, is say most days slack water is a pretty sort of... That's it. Yeah, slack water can be a, a pretty dour affair. Not much gets caught. I'm generalising. Not much seems to get caught during slack. So I normally have a sandwich and a cup of tea through slack water and then, and then chuck back in. That tea went very cold, very fast. There's quite a bit of wind chill today. 
it's definitely a I'm not stopping out here all day day I'm going up going home as soon as we get to slack water when you take the you obviously taking the bait off the hook to, to rebait and then when you chuck it in the water the amount of times that that sort of adds itself as ground bait I think sometimes because the amount of fish that come up and they've got one of those bait as well as having the bait that you've put on your hooks inside this you know the, the throat will be another bait that's been cut off see that quite regular I'm sure everybody's aware of it but codling are really really voracious feeders they will very you know they, they'll eat anything literally they'll have a go at anything they'll show a preference for certain things on certain days oh there we go yeah they'll show a preference for certain things on certain days but we were fishing a group a, a group of my friends were on uh, I think it was the back end of last week and one of them had some chicken drumsticks in his pack up and he chucked, he, so he ate the meat off him and then he chucked two chicken drumsticks over the side and I, I am not exaggerating, I'm not lying the people that were on board will back me up on that uh, the next day we were fishing in the same area and somebody caught a codling with a chicken drumstick in its gut. This is the lead stuck behind or into whatever the feature is, it's stuck. So sometimes it appears to just let a bit of slack off and the tide will take the lead back and then when you wind down it's come out this one doesn't want to though I might have to do this one by hand That's the lead out. I don't know whether the fish is still on, I didn't feel. But we'll wind that up now. Oop. There's something still on, I don't know if it's a doggy or... It's a fish of one sort or another. Oh no, another little codling. The average size seems to be getting smaller rather than bigger. He's a very lean little chap, that one. Very lean. out hopefully you can go and be a 20 pounder of the future <laughs> yeah I don't like to leave an unproductive rod for too long I think there's a few bites to be had it's easier to gauge it um, like when you're on the boat it's easier to gauge it round the boat if there's if there's regular bites coming around and I'm not getting any then I'm like am I doing something wrong well I kind of know the method um, I'm in the wrong place on the boat because sometimes that can happen I think that you're just unlucky and you're not sat in quite exactly the right place so what I'll try and do then is I'll depending on where I am on the boat 
I will try and exploit my, I will cast to different parts of my area of the boat and it, sometimes that can make a difference. I'll either, I'll maybe just drop right at the side of the boat and go under it because a lot of fish get caught straight down the side of the boat or, you know, off the back. I've, I've had people who've fished in other parts of the country, as in, you know, they've uptided in maybe the Bristol Channel or the Mersey or, and they, they talk about the scare factor of the, the anchor and the boat. Now, some people might disagree, but from what I've experienced, because of the depth of water that we're fishing in in Whitby, I've never known it make a discernible difference. So I see so many fish caught from underneath the boat that it can't scare them that much. And more often, when we uh, change, you know, if I, if I lift the anchor and we change positions, we're going to go and fish somewhere else. When we've moved, or while we're moving, I normally bo I'll boil the kettle and then make a cup of tea when I've put the anchor down. So the engine's still running. When I get into the new position, the engine's still running. I'll make a cup of tea, and by the time I come up with it, people are bringing fish up, so they can't be that scared. And it's just fallen out now, but the reason that I didn't get a bite on that rod is it was tangled. So that sort of reinforces the theory that if you're not getting a bite when you think you should, recast. I was just thinking then about bait and how much I'm going through today. I mean, I'm fishing two rods. Um, mo most people come just fish one. And in all honesty, I think it's better to fish one rod well than two rods not so well. So when you start getting a, a few bites, you can end up, if you fall behind, that you end up with no rods in the water. So, but when it comes to bait quantities, I, I normally advise my customers that have not done it before to bring two packs of dirty squid, of the dirty unwashed squid, and two, two packs of worm. In a pack of worms, you get 10 worms. And that'll normally, f fishing one rod for the day That'll normally be enough, unless, if you change it really regular, then go for three of each, or two, two squid and three worm. I'm just trying to think if there's any, any other bits of uptiding advice that I can think of that I haven't passed on. Yeah, so the length, length of the uptiding trips, we normally start start thinking about uptide in, in sort of November-ish. It's all, all dependent on sea conditions, weather, as to whether the water's stirred up, because the water needs to be, you know, you want some colour in the water for uptiding. Uh, so you, normally that gets stirred up by the, you know, we get a northerly winds or, and that'll stir the water up a bit. Um, and typically we'll leave, because at that time of year, it doesn't get light till, well, 7.30, 7.45 some mornings. So most uptide in trips, we start 7.45 in the, uh, sorry, 7.30 in the morning we'll leave. And then we're back in around four in the afternoon. The only, the only differences will be when I can make better use of a tide. So sometimes I'll switch it by half an hour, maybe go out you know, an hour into the dark so that we can get to an area and be fishing at the best part of the tide just so hopefully we can get a few more bites. Right, so this is Last Chance Saloon, last cast. Got two fresh baits to go on. And that'll do. I've only been fishing for a couple of hours. We managed to get a few bites. But hopefully the, the, the purpose of it 
was to come and do hopefully a few pointers for people who are wondering what the old uptiding thing's all about. As you can see, it's not difficult, but like everything, there's, there is a technique to it. No, I think that's going to be our lot. But anyway, managed a couple of hours fishing and caught a few. So, to summarise the session, or to summarise the short little trip, hopefully the things, some of the key things to take away are to be organised when you come. Oh well. At least we can finish with a fish, Whatever, albeit a very small one. Yeah, so to summarise, be organised. Get your traces... Oh no, the seal's got it. Yeah, there we go, that tells you all you need. He was on hunt mode this morning. So, yeah, be organised, bring your... You know, get your traces already tied up so you don't have to spend your day tying new traces. Uh, bait is really important. Bring good bait, fresh bait, not some manky old squid that you found in your freezer from last summer. Get some fresh squid. Um, having the right tackle really helps. Uh, you can use a wrecking rod so long as it's got something like a softish tip. Um, or use my gear. That's always an option. I've shown you about the, the technique for, for casting, feeling it down, how to deal with a bite so you don't spend your day just striking at every single indication. Yeah, so I'd like, hopefully, there was something in there to help some people. That's all I ever try and do with these videos. I don't know whether I'm going to do it or not. I'll, I'll, I might bring somebody with me next time, but I still, I'm not right sure how I would film it. So that's something that's still on the drawing board. So you could see somebody else's take on the uptiding, downtiding. But I'm going to run back up to Whitby now, get in that wheelhouse and get warmed up because as I keep saying, it's been pretty cold. We're not at the end of uptiding season yet, and there's still plenty of availability on my calendar for getting a trip in. So normally have a look on charterboats.co.uk, find Sea Urchin Whitby, and yeah, come and have a day out with us. But when you come, please bring the sunshine, because it's freezing. Thanks for watching.